Happy Friday and welcome to another edition of WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting May 20th, 2013, coming to you from Ossert on the beautiful Australian Gold Coast. I'm going to make today's episode short because I need to get back to the conference floor, but let me start with a few highlights from the Ossert conference itself. In fact, let me share one of my favorite presentations, which was a keynote speech given from H.D. Moore, the creator of Metasploit. During this presentation, Moore quickly shared some of his findings for a research project where he scanned the entire internet. Uh, this is the data that actually has provided him the material for a lot of the research white papers he's been releasing lately, such as the Universal Plug and Play white paper and the paper on vulnerabilities in serial out of band devices. In any case, he released a lot of interesting statistics about computers that are still quite insecure on the internet. Uh, his big finding, of course, was that by far the most active servers on the internet were Universal Plug and Play devices. And he, of course, found many vulnerabilities in those. But he also found many uh, Telenet and in, in, uh, FTP servers that were insecure and still wide open, as well as many uh, embedded devices that manage some very important critical infrastructure open as well. I'll try to share a link to his research material in the reference section of our WatchGuard Security Center post related to this video. Next, let me share some obligatory software updates from the week. First, if you use Google Chrome's browser, you need to go update. Uh, this week, uh, Google released Chrome 27, which fixes about 14 vulnerabilities in the very popular browser, including many that attackers could use for drive-by download attacks. So hopefully you have Chrome set to auto-update, but if not, go update as soon as possible. On top of that, if you're an Apple QuickTime user, whether you use it on Mac or Windows, they also released a patch that fixes 12 flaws of the popular media player. These are flaws that attackers can trigger by getting you to download a maliciously crafted movie or MP3 file. So if you have any of those products, go patch as quickly as you can. Another big story this week was some interesting new updates about the 2009-2010 uh, Operation Aurora Google hack. You probably remember this incident from a few years back where alleged Chinese hackers gained access to Google's network and stole a lot of intellectual property and sensitive data. A lot of people said the attack had to do with them trying to get access to email addresses for Tibetan activists and things like that. However, some new information has surfaced from some unnamed U.S. government sources that suggests that these Chinese attackers were also uh, trying to gain access to some sensitive U.S. government surveillance information. Apparently among Google's databases were some court cases that had information about U.S. government surveillance projects. And uh, these government officials supposed that the Chinese government wanted to get their hands on this. So this is some interesting new information about that older nation-state attack. And we'll keep you updated if we hear anything else. Next, I want to share an interesting legal cybersecurity story. Apparently, over the past few weeks, a couple of journalists uh, were doing Google searches associated with a couple of different telecoms. And in their Google searches, they eventually found out how to gain access to 170,000 records for these telecoms customers. And as good citizens, once they found out how to accidentally gain access to this information via Google searches, they actually reported it to the telecoms to some unexpected results. Apparently, uh, some lawyers from these telecoms have sent them letters basically accusing them of hacking, using automated uh, techniques to gain access to this private information. Now, the journalists claim they found this information just using normal Google searches, and yet these telecoms are actually calling them hackers and threatening to prosecute them under U.S.'s Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So it's kind of an interesting legal security story around cyber security and cyber crime. And if we hear of any interesting updates about it, we'll be sure to let you know. 
It's no secret I'm a gamer, so it's always fun for me to share game-related security issues. During this week, one of the researchers from a company I don't really like called Revon, and the researcher's name is Luigi Arima, uh, released information about many vulnerabilities in some very popular first-person shooter game engines. These are engines like Unreal Engine 4, CryEngine 3, ID Tech 4, all the most popular uh, first-person shooter uh, engines. In any case, Luigi had found many memory corruption and buffer overflow vulnerabilities in these various engines that he could leverage to execute code execution and denial of service attacks. In one one of his proof of concept demos, he showed how he could leverage one of these online gaming servers to attack these vulnerabilities, thus actually gaining remote access to some of the players of these games. In this month's Radio Free Security episode, we actually talk about some attack campaigns that are specifically targeting game developers. So it's interesting to see uh, Luigi's research talking about these game engine vulnerabilities as well. So keep your eye out for patches for any first person shooter games. So let me end with a quick tech tip and some good news. This week, Twitter finally announced that they now support two-factor authentication. The capability to now use not only your password, but an SMS message that also contains another token of authentication for you to log on to Twitter. Now, this follows the release of two-factor authentication for many other people. Gmail's had it for a while, Facebook has it, and some other big organizations have it as well. If you're not using two-factor authentication yet on those particular websites, I highly recommend and you do so immediately. And if you're a Twitter user, now that they support it, you should go out and use it. Right now, uh, hacktivists and bad guys are often trying to take over accounts. In fact, in one of the keynotes here at Ossert, Google's Mark Jones claimed that Google sees over 100,000 accounts being hijacked every day. So it really is a big, big issue. And right now, a lot of hacktivists, like the Syrian Electronic Army, have hijacked a lot of high-profile Twitter accounts. So again, Again, now that Twitter supports two-factor authentication, I recommend you turn it on and use it. So that covers yet another week in information security. Thanks for watching this quick on-the-road edition of our video. As always, if you're interested in more regular security stories, be sure to follow the WatchGuard Security Center blog, follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, and follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.